Epitaph Benson, in which he's speaking of the Doctrine and Covenants, and he says so well and appropriately what needs to be said that I'd like to make this the beginning of our discussion today and also of this seminar. 150 years ago, when the elders of the Church were assembled in conference to determine whether the Revelation should be published to the world, that's the November 1831 conference. The Lord gave a revelation to the Church which he referred to as his preface, and I found in section 1, if I can interpolate that, he referred to as his preface to his book of revelations. This revelation, section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants, perhaps the reader <coughs> uh, prepares the reader as a preface to a book should do with an explanation of the purpose of the author in giving the revelations contained in it. The author of the Doctrine and Covenants is the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking through the instrumentality of the prophet Joseph Smith. The Doctrine and Covenants is unique among the standard works of the Church, not only because it contains a divinely authored preface, but also because it is a modern book of Scripture. President Benson, as you know, has stated clearly that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. And then later he made it clear that the Doctrine and Covenants is the capstone. And we'll um, be bringing that point out from time to time as, as we discuss this valuable scripture. Just a word or two to begin with about the history of the Doctrine and Covenants, how we got it. You have revelations in there, section 2, for example, that go back as early as 1823. Uh, section 2, as we know, is the uh, statement of Moroni concerning Malachi's prophecy, or the restatement, and adds several significant items, and we'll be dealing with those later in our discussion. But the first official statement that was canonized as scripture other than the Bible and the Book of Mormon was a little document, document called the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. Now, the Articles and Covenants of the Church originally contained what we now have in sections 20 and 22, and then later section 22 was locked off, if I can use that term, made a separate document. And the Articles and Covenants, then, make reference to section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And so, for example, in section 42 of the Doctrine and Covenants, in verse 13, where the Lord, in giving us the law of the Church, and section 42 has that nickname, just like section 20 is sometimes called the Constitution, section 42 is called the law, and section 76, the vision. You see, but in section 42, which we call the law, he says, And they shall observe the covenants and church articles to keep them, and uh, these shall be their teachings as they shall be directed by the Spirit. Now, the first conference held in the church was held in June of 1830, and in the course of that conference they presented the standard works of the church as of then. And this consisted of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. And that's the way they called them and presented them. So that uh, the first thing canonized in this dispensation, uh, other than the Bible and the Book of Mormon, was this little unit that uh, is the nucleus of the, of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then as later revelations were given, it was finally determined that these revelations be compiled and published under uh, a book entitled The Book of Commandments. If you turn to section uh, 67 of the Doctrine and Covenants, for example, you find the Lord uh, making reference here to this anticipated publication. In verse 6, he says, Now seek ye out of the book of commandments, even the least that is among them, and appoint him that is the most wise among you, 
And this has reference then to some brethren feeling that these revelations weren't quite uh, in the most polished form of the, of the Queen's English, and uh, they wanted to overhaul them. And we had uh, an intellectual in the church in that day, he was one of their humble school teachers, <coughs> uh, by the name of William, William E. McClellan. And they selected him out to write uh, a revelation uh, equal to the least of those in this proposed compilation. And he utterly failed. Sometimes if you want to try that, just take a clean sheet of paper and write up the words, Thus saith the Lord, right at the top, and then take it from there. And uh, that's the challenge that they presented him with, and that's the challenge that he failed to meet. But uh, after that conference, uh, where it was decided to publish these revelations, then they purchased a press and shipped it down to Jackson County, Missouri, because uh, it was there that the prophet had been the previous summer uh, to uh, uh, dedicate the land of Zion. And uh, Oliver Cowdery was there with W. W. Phelps as the printers of the church, and they began the publication of a church periodical called The Evening and the Morning Star. And along with that, then they had the task of publishing this forthcoming volume called The Book of Commandments. Now, they were moving along the way in this, and uh, uh, how far they got in the project isn't quite clear. Some people think they, were, they, they had finished it, but this is not the case. And I'll explain this a little bit later why not. But uh, in July of 1834, the uh, mob came upon them, and uh, they uh, rushed upstairs in the building where the printing office was centered, uh, dumped the uh, printing press out the window, and just scattered the type, and confiscated all of the material that they had thus far printed, and uh, took these. Uh, uh, documents and stashed them away in an old log house right next to a cornfield and set a guard to guard them. Uh, that was the end of the publication of the Book of Commandments, except for the fact that there was a plucky young man by the name of John Taylor, not he who became president of the church later, but uh, while the guard was on one side of the building, he found a large enough crack between the logs on the other side, and he uh, uh, pulled out a whole arm load and had himself all loaded up just as the guard came around the corner, and uh, being discovered, he headed into the cornfields. And the corn was as high as an elephant's eye, as the psalm says, <clears throat> and uh, he became lost to the guard and buried uh, the documents and later then sent them to the prophet Joseph in, in Kirkland. And he had them bound up such as they were, and uh, uh, distributed to the brethren. And that was the end of that project. And I might just note in passing that this, this little document today is a very, very valuable document. There are just a very few of these still in existence. If you happen to have one in your attic, don't settle for anything less than 100000 for it, and probably more than that. Uh, they're very, very rare, and they command uh, uh, a price much greater than that which they originally uh, were intended to be sold at. All right, now, with this effort, then uh, uh, they later decided to publish an enlarged version, and uh, this came off press, finally, in the uh, late summer of 1835 under the name Doctrine and Covenants. Now, that term, that name itself, uh, has its origin in the contents of that uh, particular volume. The Prophet Joseph Smith, previous to that, had uh, uh, compiled a set of lectures called the Lectures on Faith. That's the name that they are now presently designated by. And, uh, uh, these were theological treatises, not revelations, 
But because they were so valuable and important, and because uh, they wanted uh, all the saints to have them and study them seriously, they were published with the, with the compilation of Revelations. And the word doctrine comes from the theological treatises in the Lectures on Faith and has reference to that part or that division of the book. And the word covenants then comes from the revelations in the, in the publication. So the term doctrine then referred to the Lectures on Faith, covenants referred uh, to the revelations. Now, these were published with the Doctrine and Covenants until you come to about like, the 1921 edition. And then, uh, since uh, they're, they're not revelations, and uh, uh, for that reason then, they felt it not uh, appropriate to continue their publication, and so they were deleted from the Doctrine and Covenants, the name Doctrine and Covenants still staying, and designating now both the, uh, the revelations and the truths then contained within them. But uh, let me just suggest, in relation to the lectures on faith, and you can buy them, uh, I have a set of them here, uh, compiled by Brother Lundwald. You can get them in other covers. Uh, one of the most valuable documents in the history of the Church. Let me suggest that you read it at least 20 times, and then study it. And you'll have to in order to really get what's there, because it's got some tremendously important things. And uh, note particularly the orientation of everything the prophet says. He's teaching us then how to really commune with the Lord and how to come to him, and finally, like the brother of Jared, get to the point where the next step up is in. And if you really master the lectures on faith, then you'll have uh, a rather fair knowledge of the basic ideas that we need to do and implement in order to come to the Lord uh, and receive those ultimate blessings. Well, so much then for the history of the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, that volume then, as we've said, came from the press 1835. There are other editions in the Prophet Joseph Smith's day, and other revelations were added. Uh, in section 87, for example, the prophecy on war was not a part of the original publication or even of the Doctrine and Covenants in Joseph Smith's day. The first place the, re the prophecy on war was published was in the Pearl of Great Christ, which was not published initially as a, a standard work of the Church. It was published by Brother Franklin D. Richards over in England in order for the saints to have access to some of these choice writings, and as a part of that he included the Prophecy on War, 1851, uh, nine years or ten years before the coming of the Civil War, but at least uh, uh, it was not uh, in the Doctrine of Covenants. Since it's been added to it, and so the Doctrine of Covenants wasn't a stable book in 1835. It's been added, and in our own day we've then seen the official declaration regarding the extension of priesthood to all people and all classes of people. And we've also seen the inclusion of the Prophet Gildersen's revelation in January of 1836, now contained in section 137, and also the vision of Joseph F. Smith concerning the redemption of the dead. These were modern developments in our own time. Now, when you make an attack on the book on the Doctrine of Covenants, you want to study it. It's good to kind of know the general outline of the book. It's organization. And uh, over the years, there have been different arrangements of the revelations within the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, all past editions have not been arranged as our present edition. But uh, the present edition then goes back to the original and picks things up and uh, is, I think, the, the most consistent arrangement. It starts out with the Lord's Preface. The Lord's Preface. And this was given in November of 1831, and it was given specifically as a preface. Now, what does a preface do? Well, a preface then announces the book, and it gives an overview of the book. It doesn't deal so much with specifics, but it gives an overview of the, of the document itself, and uh, states its intent, states its authority, states its purpose. 
And so you have the Lord beginning then, how can know ye my people of my church, saith the voice of him who dwells on high, whose eyes are upon all men, yea, verily I say, hearken ye people from afar, and either upon the isles of the sea, listen together, for verily the voice of the Lord is unto all men. And there is none to escape, and there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated. And the rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow, for their iniquity shall be spoken above, uh, spoken upon the housetops, and their secret acts shall be revealed. Now that wasn't to take place in Joseph Smith's day, but the ultimate, the ultimate consequence or result of the of this dispensation and its work is going to finally it will be to subdue wickedness, to establish righteousness, and in that day, even the secret acts of men uh, will be made manifest. If you read section 37 of the, of, uh, the book of Alma, not section, but chapter 37 of the, of the book of Alma, you find the Lord makes reference here to a future person calling him by the office and title that he has or will have. Now that office and title is that of Gazella, G-A-Z-E-L-E-M. Gazellum is one who has access to the Urim and Thummim. And uh, the Urim and Thummim, as we'll discuss it a little later, operates on a visual principle. You look into it and you see. And he says, uh, Verse 23, the Lord said, I will prepare unto my servant Gazelle, a stone, which shall shine forth in darkness unto light, that I may discover unto my people who serve me, that I may discover unto them the works of their brethren, yea, their secret works, their works of darkness, and their wickedness and abomination. And uh, so the time will come when uh, righteousness triumphs, and the Lord sets things in order that the very secret acts of men will be brought out, and as the Lord says in section 1, be spoken upon the housetop. See? Now that's the Lord's statement of introduction, calling upon the people of the earth, telling the ultimate consequences, and then as he continues in this revelation, he states the authority of, of the priesthood in our time, and uh, indicates that this book is a, a book of warning. It's a voice of warning unto all people, and uh, then he states some very basic purposes in relation to this dispensation and its works after telling us what he thinks about many people in that day and our day. Uh, verse 15, For they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, whose substance is that of an idol which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, and even Babylon and the great which shall fall. And having stated that situation, which exists and too often exists even among the saints of the church, then he tells us uh, uh, about his work, about the call of the prophet Joseph Smith in verse 17, about the revelations he has given and would give to him, and these then that uh, that which uh, might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. Number one, the weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. That uh, that's, leads into the Savior's statement that the meek will finally inherit the earth. And the weak things of the world then, not weak in the sense of walking mats, but weak in the sense of uh, worldly power and worldly influence and the vanity and the haughtiness of the world, these things will come forth and break down that which is mighty and strong, through the teaching of the gospel and the building of the Lord's kingdom. Number two, that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh. It's not right to counsel another person, unless, as Nephi says, your counsels are dictated by the power of the Holy Ghost. It just isn't right the counsel except on that principle. Number three, that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, the Savior of the world. Now there's a tremendous sense of personal dignity there. The gospel is not designed merely to herd us into a program and then, like a, a herd of sheep, 
And I use the word herd rather than flock, which is anciently led by a shepherd, like a herd of sheep just being pushed around and finally then pushed into the celestial kingdom. The idea is that each person be spiritually renewed in Christ, that each person get a testimony, that each person learn to get the Spirit of the Lord and to live by it, so that the dictates of the Holy Spirit become the foundation of each individual's life and then to grow in that principle so that every man and every woman can speak in the name of God the Lord, the Savior of the world. And then on the basis of friendship and love and mutual covenant, supporting channels of revelation in the priesthood callings, then work and operate as a free, independent people with a dignity in Christ and a humility in Christ. See? Now, that's the ideal. And he says that faith might also increase. That's another reason. And then uh, number 22 is, is the one that uh, uh, we're concerned with, that my everlasting covenant might be established. And see, Zion, Zion is not a free society. And Zion is not a collective society. Zion is a covenant society. A covenant society is a, is a society based on freedom. And then it's based on people being sensitive to the Spirit and opening their souls to the Spirit and then entering into covenant relationships with God through Christ and then covenant relationships with each other. And this then, in his overall program, is the, the uh, covenant of the everlasting gospel. And it reaches on up through then to the higher order of covenants in the house of the Lord and fullness of priesthood and that program by which we become exalted as, as gods and goddesses. Seen. And then verse 23, uh, point 6 in the ideas that he mentions here, and this is the one that I literally fulfilled, and there are others here in the group today who literally fulfilled it too. He says that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world <coughs> and before kings and rulers. <coughs> And uh, these then are the purposes. Now, this, uh, this uh, prophet then also speaks uh, of the Lord's declarations and intents concerning the latter day. Verse 35, I am no respecter of persons, and will that all men shall know that the day speedily cometh, the hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth, and the devil shall have power over his own dominion. And also the Lord shall have power over his saints, and shall reign in their midst, and shall come down in judgment upon Idumea or the world. Now, we've had prophets of God, for example, presently uh, made statements to this effect, and President Kimball's made statements to this effect, and President Benson has, that we are now entering that period spoken of in this great statement, where... Uh, the Lord is going to come down in judgment, and where the devil has his power and is well organized, uh, better organized than he's ever been to carry out his purposes, and where also the Lord shall have power over his saints and reign in their midst. Now, it's not fully fulfilled. It will be fully fulfilled after Zion is cleansed and after the uh, center place is established and when Christ reigns personally among his saints, years before he comes in glory, when he comes and reigns personally among his saints uh, and gives them teachings and instructions uh, and develops them in the knowledge of his kingdom so that when he comes to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, then he will have a group of people through whom he can reign over the earth in its millennial state. But uh, we'll get to that part of the program a little bit later. All right, so you have the preface, then, of the, of the Doctrine and Covenants. That's the first unit. And then the second unit is the body of materials. Now, the body of materials consists of those revelations from, from section 2 up through section 132. Section 2 up through and including section 132. And these revelations are organized, by and large, 
in chronological order. And uh, they conclude then with the revelation dictated by the prophet in July of 1843 concerning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. All right, now, along with uh, the preface, way back then in, in November of 1831, the Lord also dictated what may be called a conclusion or a, an appendix, a summary revelation. And that summary revelation, or that appendix, is found in section 133. And it's designed then to be the end of the revelations as much as section 1 was designed to be the beginning. Now, we said, for example, that the Book of Commandments was not completely finished. Uh, it runs up through about section 68 or so, as I remember. Uh, and. Uh, then uh, well, it, at least uh, I don't. I thought I had the figure there, but uh, at least it wasn't uh, wasn't complete and didn't contain all the revelations that Joseph Smith had then received. Uh, Oliver Cowdery and W. W. Phelps were in the process of doing the publishing, and they were also printing the church newspaper, the Evening and Morning Star. And in one of the issues of the Evening and Morning Star, uh, W. W. Phelps indicates that they intended then uh, to complete this volume, but since section 133, that wasn't the name of it then, but that's our name it for it now, was so important that they published it in the Evening and Morning Star, stating that it was the, the last revelation to be contained within that publication. Well, when the Book of Commandments was, uh, uh, was uh, not published due to the mob action and uh, the work terminated, the, uh, the volumes that we have don't go up that far. Some people say that they published everything they had, but Bud W. Phelps says they intended to put section 133 as a caboose on the end of the revelations. Now, in that sense, then, you have a body, you have a preface, and then you have the conclusion, and then along with this conclusion, we've added uh, specific things that pertain to, to the appendix uh, phase of the book. We put in there section 134, which is not a revelation, but was written as a statement of the Latter-day Saint view on church and state. And then section 135, John Taylor's writings, in which uh, he uh, gives us the uh, uh, testimony of the Church concerning the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith. And then section 136, uh, given at winter quarters to Brigham Young, called The Word and the Will of the Lord, uh, giving the design of organization for the movement of the Church westward into the Great Basin of the Salt Lake uh, area. And uh, then since then, we've had the Manifesto of the 1890 time, section 137, section 138, and uh, the statement then concerning the extension of priesthood then to all worthy uh, male members uh, of the Church. Now, in that sense, then, when you read the Doctrine of Covenants, it's well then to know the, the basic uh, pattern and idea of it as, as a body and as a book. Now, when Joseph Smith uh, was involved in receiving these revelations, he literally lived and breathed the spirit of revelation. And this is hard for us today to, to really fathom, unless uh, you've lived personally with someone who lives and breathes the spirit of revelation, and uh, there aren't too many who have had that opportunity, uh, you really can't quite fathom the prophet Joseph. He, he, he lived with his feet on earth in a solid, practical way, in practical world, and in many ways his head was above the veil. And over and over and over again the, the visions were opened to him. Over and over again the Lord appeared to him personally and uh, gave him uh, revelations and commandments. For example, when the prophet uh, moved from New York into Ohio, arriving uh, 
uh, in the Kirtland area early in, in February of 1831. Uh, Mule K. Whitney, who was uh, uh, one of the joint owners of the Gilbert and Whitney store, had an extra home or a building, and the Prophet and Emma uh, were invited to, to occupy this. Now, most of the people who had received the gospel in that area, and the gospel just spread like wildfire through the Kirtland area, uh, most of these people had not seen the Prophet. And so when it was noised about that he was there, then immediately everyone began to congregate uh, uh, at the place of his residence. And uh, there was a group that uh, came there when they arrived. The Prophet wasn't there, but they kind of stood around like Latter-day Saints uh, socializing and and mingling together and talking and sharing the spirit of sociality that exists among them. And then the Prophet Joseph came in with Martin Harris and uh, some others, and he looked around at the group and uh, said, Hey, you know, we've got enough here that we could have a meeting. Well, they didn't have a place to set them, so they went out and got some planks. And they set planks between chairs so we'd have something to sit on. And then Martin Hare sat down at the Prophet's feet on a box right down here. And the Prophet uh, uh, got up and began to speak. And as he began to speak, the power of the Spirit came rested upon him in such a phenomenal way that it was just about like his uh, whole countenance shone on occasions like this, and this happened on more than one occasion, the light that shone from him outshone the, uh, the light of the candle on the hearth zone. He had that much of an endowment of the Spirit. And uh, as he, he spoke then on that occasion, he finally stopped and stood still. And as one person said who was there, I couldn't take my eyes away from him. It just, uh, it just seemed like that there was an endowment there, and, and I could almost see his cheekbones. And then the prophet says, Brothers and sisters, do you know who has been in your midst this evening? And one of the smiths ventured, an angel of the Lord, and the prophet didn't say anything. Martin Harris, who was sitting on this box, slid to his knees, clasped the prophet around the knees, and looked up at him and says, I know who it was. It was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the prophet put his hand on Martin's head and says, Martin, the Lord revealed that to you. The Lord has been present and is here, but he's cast a veil over you because you cannot bear to see him. And then he went on to say, He has given you all to me and commanded me to seal you up unto eternal life, thereby making their calling election sure as individuals to the celestial kingdom. Now, that kind of experience happens over and over and over again with the prophet Joseph. And he literally lived and breathed the, the spirit of revelation. And uh, the powers of the spirit centered in him in a phenomenal manner. Uh, let me see if I can find a statement here that might, uh, might be helpful just to, to show you what I mean. As uh, uh, we get it from, from some people who knew and who understood him. He says, for example, I do not remember, let's see, it is impossible for me to express my feelings in regard to this period of my life. This is William Taylor, who is a brother to President John Taylor. I have never known the same joy and satisfaction in the, in the companionship of other people or the man or woman that I felt with him, the man who conversed with the Almighty. He was always the most companionable and lovable of all men. And then he goes on to say that he had the spirit of revelation with him in a marvelous and phenomenal manner, to the extent that he just an attractive person by, by the living powers of the spirit that, that he possessed. And uh, this, this spiritual appeal becomes very, very important. Let me read you a couple of statements in regard to it. He drew from this to, to get the, the spirit of teaching and uh, the spirit of knowledge 
One of the brethren in that day was a good brother by the name of Wandel Mace, weighed about 225 pounds, very athletic, and uh, a tremendous person in his study of the gospel. Before he joined the church, he had memorized, and I'm talking about reading, he had memorized the New Testament. And uh, he had an ingenious mind. He had uh, several patents that he had uh, uh, secured for inventions that he made. He was a convert from New York City, came to Nauvoo, and became a close and intimate friend of the Prophet. He was one of the workers on the Nauvoo Temple. And when the Prophet would come and see them, uh, Prophet being athletic and agile, that kind of thing, he'd get Wandel Mace by the nab of the neck and say, Come on, Wandel, let's go out and have a wrestle. And Wandel tried it once or twice, <clears throat> but thereafter he didn't want to do it anymore. He found himself <clears throat> laying on his back most of the time. But the Prophet had a lot of fun with the boys. And, uh, but when they would get together at the temple, then someone would say, Jordan, talk to us. And Jordan would say, What do you want to talk about? And someone would suggest a subject, and then they'd all just sit back and the work would go without being done, and they'd listen to the prophet. Now, Wandel Mace makes this statement. He says, I have listened to the prophet Joseph in public and in private, in sunshine and in shower, as many others have done. He says, I know that no man could explain the scriptures, throw them wide open to view, so plain that none could misunderstand their meaning except that he had been taught of God. He says, I have felt ashamed of myself sometimes, having studied the scriptures so much, that I had not seen that which was so plain when he touched them. He, as it were, turned the key, and the door of knowledge sprang wide open, disclosing precious principles, both new and old. Now, that's the kind of thing that you see with the with the prophet Joseph Smith. Here's Brigham Young. Joseph Smith, the prophet of the last days, had a happy facility, or faculty rather, of reducing the things of heaven to the capacity of persons of common understanding, often in a single sentence, throwing a flood of light into the gloom of ages. He had power to draw the spirits of the people who listened to him to his standard. When they commenced to uh, when they communed with, with heavenly objects and heavenly principles, connecting the heavenly and the earthly together in one blending flood of heavenly intelligence. Here's uh, Mary Thompson. She's the sister of uh, uh, Joseph F. Smith's mother, Mary Thieling. No, this is, this, this is uh, not Mary, Martha, Martha Thompson. She says, I have heard him explain to the brethren and sisters the glorious principles of the gospel as no man could expect, um, no man could except by prophetic power. To him all things seemed simple and easy to be understood, and thus he would make them plain to others as no other man could that I have ever heard. Here's Newell uh, K. Whitney. No wonder he should smite himself upon the breast with which treasured up his mighty secrets and exclaim, as we are told he often did, Would to God, brethren, I could tell you who I am. Would to God I could tell you what I know. Now, it's this kind of a person that we're dealing with, with the prophet Joseph Smith. See, we're dealing with a person then who lives and breathes the spirit of revelation. When he finished translating the Book of Mormon, he took the Urim and Thummim, which operates visually, and read the Bible. That's the time I would like to have been with him. He uh, left the area of Palm Island back to Harmony. See, the Book of Mormon was completed in the latter part of June, early July, and then the prophet's down in the Harmony area until it comes time to organize the church. And uh, it's this period of time, then, that he took the Urim and Thummim, which operates visually, and read the Bible. He says, I read the book of Genesis, and I saw the things that are recorded there. Now, you think for a minute what that means. He says, then I read the book of Exodus, and I saw the things that were recorded there. And he says, I so continued from one book to another until I had read the whole. He says, it all passed before me like a great panorama. And then he commented on the sectarian ministers who were bombarding him with ignoramus old Joe Smith and all that. And he says, well, I've forgotten a thousand times more about the Bible than they ever knew. Now, 
you have to see this, this image of Joseph in order to understand the man, in order, for example, to, to see and understand him as, as a person and to understand the origins of the Baptist and Covenants. For example, he says, I saw Adam in the valley of Adam on Diamond. He called together his children and blessed them with the patriarchal blessing. The Lord appeared in their midst, and he, Adam, blessed them all and foretold what should befall them in the latest generations. I saw Adam. He's not just saying the Lord told me about this. Then he talks, for example, about Noah being mobbed out four times before he got the ark built. And it's a choice little insight on Noah and the challenges that he had, even though he was uh, the king and priest over the world of that day, the corruption was such that he had that kind of difficulty in building the ark for the preservation of the human family, see. But you have to see that picture in order to see Joseph Smith. Now, he is a seer, a prophet, a seer and a revelator. A seer is one who sees. Over here in the book of Moses, chapter 6, we have the account of Enoch, anciently. And uh, beginning at verse 35, the Lord spake unto Enoch, and said unto him, Anoint thine eyes with clay, and wash them, and thou shalt see. And he did. And he beheld the spirits that God had created. And uh, he beheld also things which were not visible to the natural eye. And from thence came the saying abroad in the land, A seer hath the Lord raised up unto his people. Now a seer, a seer then is one who sees visually. And when it comes to the prophet Joel Smith, for example, and his translation of the Book of Mormon, he didn't translate by mere intellectual power. He translated as a seer through the spirit of revelation and through the seeric gift that he had. For example, in Mosiah chapter 18 of the Book of Mormon, you have the account of the Nephites finding the record of the Jeroboites and wanting to know how they can get uh, a knowledge of these plates that they had found. And uh, Ammon then is there on the scene to tell how they can do it. He, uh, in fact, this, I say 18, this is, this is uh, chapter 8. I'll give you a uh, bad reference. In verse 13, he says, Now Ammon said unto him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king of a man, that can translate the records. For he has wherewith that he can look and translate all records uh, that are of an ancient date. He has wherewith he can look. It's a visual process. He says that, and it is a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters, and no man can look in them, except he be commanded, lest he should look, for that he ought not, and should perish. And whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer. Now, you don't have to have a urine and thumb to be a seer. Enoch didn't have one, apparently, when he had his experience, although I'm sure he later did. Uh, but uh, the basic point is that a seer is one who sees. Now, when it comes to the prophet Joseph Smith, then, he translated as a seer. The basic point is that a seer is one who sees. Now, when it comes to the prophet Joseph Smith, then, he translated as a seer. For example, in section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which deals with the <coughs> last book uh, of Lehi, the initial uh, part of the abridgment of Mormon, which uh, he translated, he, the Lord is, is reprimanding him for that loss. <coughs> telling him he has no more gift, and this is the gift of revelation and seership. And then in verse 12, he says, When thou deliverest up that which God had given thee sight and power to translate, thou deliverest up that which was sacred into the hands of a wicked man. See? He had given Joseph sight and power to translate. And it's this principle, then, that, that we need to see as, as a part of the, the prophet's experience. Uh, this begins very early in his life. For example, when the angel Moroni came to him in September of 1823, you remember that he disclosed to Joseph that there were sacred records in the nearby hill, which we now call the Hill Cumorah. 
And the prophet Joseph says that when he made that disclosure, he says, the vision was opened so that I could see the hill and I could see the sacred repository so that I had no difficulty in finding it the next day. Now, this is the function of seership, see? And uh, then that evening, as Moroni taught him, he used this gift. Oliver Cowdery says, for example, as he later explains the Moroni experience with the prophet, he says, when God manifests to his servants those things which are and those which are to come, he says he does it by unfolding them by the power of that spirit which, accom which comprehends all things always. And so much may be shown and made perfectly plain to the understanding in a short time that the world were occupied all their life to learn a little. Look at the relation of it, and are disposed to call it false. He says, you will understand then by this that while these glorious things were being rehearsed, the vision was also opened so that our brother, Joseph Smith, was permitted to see and understand much more fully and perfectly than we is able to communicate in writing. Now, Joseph Smith had the Book of Mormon down cold before he ever got the plates out of the hill. He knew it from beginning to end before he ever secured the plates. For example, in what we call the Wentworth Letter, John Wentworth was the editor and proprietor of the Chicago Democrat, a paper published in Chicago during the Nauvoo period of Mormon history. And when the saints moved into Illinois, he wrote to Joseph Smith and asked if he would write up a brief history of the, of the Mormons and a brief statement of their beliefs, because he wanted to, to publish it in his paper, because here's this whole influx of people who had come to, to New York from, I mean, to, to Illinois from, from Missouri, having been driven out of Missouri. And so the prophet sat down and wrote the Wentworth letter. <clears throat> And at the end of the Wentworth letter, he appended thirteen statements of belief, which we now call the Articles of Faith. Now, in this very important document, he, he gives an account of the first vision, and he also gives an account of the angel Moroni. And he says this of the latter. He says, I was informed concerning the aboriginal inhabitants of this country and shown who they were and from whence. Uh, they came. A brief sketch of their origin, progress, civilization, laws, governments, of their righteousness and iniquity, and the blessings of God being finally withdrawn from them as a people was made known unto me." See? And so the prophet then saw the Nephite colony, or the colony of Lehi, clear on down through, and in the family home evenings that they held from that time on. Uh, <clears throat> The prophet Joseph Smith then would get the, the uh, Smith family gathered around him, and as he did, then uh, uh, he would uh, uh, recount the things that, that had happened to him and recount the things that he said. And his mother, uh, Lucy Mack Smith, on more than one occasion pointed out that uh, the prophet's brothers would say to her, Mother, why don't you have dinner very early so we can have a long evening to listen to Joseph? And then he would uh, recite the things that the angel had shown to him in vision concerning the aboriginal inhabitants of this country. Now, it's this kind of thing that we need to see in order to, to appreciate the prophet Joseph. See? And the doctrine of covenants grew out of this kind of an element. It wasn't just the situation where Joseph Smith goes along and finally comes up against a problem and kneels down and says, Lord, what shall I say? And the Lord dictates something to him and he writes it down. <clears throat> now, that is the simplistic view which is actually critically out of line with the facts. The fact is that he is living and breathing the spirit of revelation. The fact is that many of these revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants come out of that. Uh, he sits down one day, for example, and talks to the brethren about the organization of councils. And uh, he says, in ancient times, when councils, priesthood councils were held, the programs were so ordered and so strictly carried out that no one could uh, 
be meandering in these thoughts on a different subject or going to sleep or walking around, but they all were expected to concentrate their efforts on the question under discussion until the spirit of revelation dictated the answer. And uh, he goes on to instruct the saints on how councils functioned anciently. Now, if you'll think of it, you'll never find that in the Bible. You find that uh, when he's talking about councils held anciently, then, uh, then he's talking about something that he had personal experience. On one occasion, he says, I was sitting in on a council that was held by the ancient presidency of the church in the meridian of time, Peter, James, and John. And he says they were talking of things so advanced in knowledge that I didn't feel that I ought to make a comment, and so I just sat and listened. Now, you have to see that kind of an experience with the prophet. And when he organizes the High Council, and we get section 102 of the High Council, Revelation, it's out of that kind of background. When he uh, organizes uh, uh, the Church, for example, and the various quorums of priesthood within it, in section 107, as he makes reference to this, he talks of the 70s, and he says, uh, and it's according to the vision showing the order of the 70 that they should have seven presidents to preside over them, chosen from the number of the 70. It's according to the vision. When he finally rolled the keys of the kingdom off onto the twelve and uh, gave them the full authority of the, of the church, then he did so with the statement, I have now completed the organization of the church according to the vision which God has given me, and I now roll these keys of the kingdom off onto you." See? All right, so many of these revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants come out of this kind of a, of a background. And if you, uh, if you uh, talk about specific points, then, there are those sections that were given, for example, by open vision. Now, section 76 is one of these. Uh, the Prophet Joseph and, and Sidney Rigdon were working on the inspired revision of the Bible. And uh, some of the fruits of that, as we know, we've had included in our scriptures of, of recent days. But in, the, in their work they came to the fifth chapter of the book of John, where Jesus there speaks of the resurrection of the dead. And uh, it says, uh, they, they read this, they who should come forth, the resurrection of the just, and they who have done evil, the resurrection of the unjust. And those two statements triggered some thinking in them and triggered their inquiry. And it says, Now this caused us to marvel, for it was given to us of the Spirit. And while we meditated upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understanding, and they were opened, and the glory of the Lord shone round about. And we beheld the glory of the Father on the right hand. Uh, of the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, and we saw the holy angels. And uh, in the prophet's poetic version of this particular revelation, he indicates that the Savior then spoke to him and gave him considerable knowledge on that occasion. So much so that the revelation that we now have itself is only a fraction of that which Joseph Smith received. Here in the teachings, page 305, the prophet makes this comment. He said, I could explain a hundredfold more than I have of the glories of the kingdoms manifested to me in the vision were I permitted, and were the people prepared to receive them. So you take section, uh, section 76, which has uh, in it uh, 119 verses, and you just multiply that by 100 so that you've got 1,000 uh, plus verses. And then you'll have what Joseph Smith could have given to us, see. Now, in the course of this uh, revelation, then the veil is parted. The prophet Joseph Smith, wearing dark clothing at the time, uh, was so transfigured that his whole being was just filled with light and knowledge. And uh, uh, he sat there in a magnificent glory. Sidney Rigdon, who was... Uh, with him was likewise enveloped, but wasn't handling the situation so well. And he was slumped down in his seat 
almost with his chin on the table. And when the prophet looked down at him, he kind of smiled and said, Brother Sidney isn't used to this like I am. But for a period of about two hours, then the vision of the human family's destiny in the future opened to the prophet Joseph. And there's one very good brother who was there at least part of the time, later recorded. He says, Joseph Smith would say at intervals, what do I see? As one might say while looking out of the window and beholding what all in the room could not see. Then he would uh, relate what he had seen or what he was looking at. Then Sidney would reply, I can see the same thing. And then presently Sidney would say, what do I see? And he would repeat what he was seeing. Or, and then Joda would say, I can see the same thing. And he says, this manner of conversation was repeated at short intervals to the end of the vision, until the, and uh, during the whole time not a word was spoken by any other person, <clears throat> not a sound nor motion made by anyone but Joda and Sidney. And it seemed to me that they never moved a joint or limb during the time that I was there, which I think was over an hour, to the end of the vision. Now, there are those revelations then in the Doctrine and Covenants that have that kind of a basis. And uh, there are those then that are the dictated words of, of angels. Section 2 of the Doctrine and Covenants is Moroni's uh, quotation of Malachi in his prophecy concerning the coming of Elijah. Section 13 is uh, the words of John the Baptist in conferring the Aaronic priesthood. Section 110 gives us the words of Moses <coughs> and of Elias or Noah and of Elijah. And so the ministry of angels then is involved and the record then of things coming from that source. And then there are revelations given through the Urim and Thummim. Now again, the Urim and Thummim operates on a visual principle. If you read the preface of some of these revelations, let me just hit one or two of the early ones, section 6 of the Doctrine and Covenants, for instance. Uh, Joseph inquired of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim and received this response. And then he and Oliver Cowdery got into a little bit of a, uh, an argument in relation to John the Revelator as they were uh, reading the testimony of, of this event in the book of John in the New Testament. And they had some question as to what happened with John the Revelator. And so in order to settle it, the prophet took the Urim and Thummim and looked into it. And he saw an ancient document. Now, he didn't possess it, but he saw it. And this ancient document was John the Revelator's written personal account of what the Lord said to him on the experience that they were talking about. And this is now recorded in section 7. It begins, And the Lord said unto me, now this is John the Revelator speaking, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? For it's, if, if you shall ask what you will, it shall be granted unto you. And I said unto him, Lord, give me power over death, that I may live and bring souls unto thee. Now, John's ministry in this respect has not been completely fulfilled. In fact, it's, it's hardly been fulfilled. It will have its fulfillment when the uh, great uh, core of priesthood brethren are called, we call the 144,000 high priests of the Holy Order, and when they gather people into the Church of the Firstborn. John, as a translated being, will be one who will function in the direction of that body of men. And as such, then, as the Lord explained to him in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, he will prophesy before kings and before nations of the earth. And so John, as a translated being, then, will have his uh, uh, ministry there. And if we can just add as a footnote to that, by the way, so also will the three Nephites. If you've read the three, third, uh, third Nephi, chapter 28, very carefully, you find that the Lord indicates that they will be a part of that function. Let me read the passage that I have referenced to. He's speaking here, for example, to the three Nephites, and uh, that is Mormon is, and he says, uh, verse 27, Behold, they will be among the Gentiles, and the Gentiles shall know them not, and they will also be among the Jews, and the Jews shall know them not. And it shall come to pass when the Lord seeth, note this, when the Lord seeth fit, in his wisdom, that they shall minister unto all the scattered tribes of Israel. Now, this is the great work 
of the 144,000 to gather out Israel into the church of the firstborn. Now, when that day comes, he says, well, the Lord sees fit that they shall minister among all the scattered tribes of Israel, and to all nations, kindred, sons, and people, and shall bring out of them unto Jesus many souls, that, they desire, that their desire may be fulfilled, and also because of the convincing power of God which is in them." See, So apparently the three Nephites will be classed among that body. But the Prophet Joseph then had this, uh, with Oliver, this little disputation on the issue, and uh, as a result this revelation is given. It contains within it another very sacred and important little point. Uh, when this promise was given to John the Revelator, by the Savior, uh, then Peter has some questions about it. And uh, the record says, For this cause the Lord said unto Peter, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? For he desired of me that he might bring souls unto me. But thou desirest that thou mightst come speedily unto me in my kingdom. Now, as Latter-day Saints, we haven't really picked up fully on what is really meant there. Thou shalt come speedily unto me in my kingdom. Now, in order to see what it means, let me turn to section 129 with you just for a minute. <clears throat> in section 129, the Lord talks about what happens to, to righteous men and women as they die and go to the spirit world. <clears throat> and he makes it clear here that they go to the enjoyment of celestial glory as disembodied spirits. In fact, the prophet Joseph Smith made such a statement himself. And so with that idea in mind, then the Revelation makes this clarification. There are two kinds of beings in heaven, namely angels who are resurrected. Resurrected personages, having bodies of flesh and bone. And it gives us an example. For instance, Jesus said, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as he see me have. Now that's one kind of being that dwells in heaven, and he dwells in celestial glory. Now the second kind, then, he says, are the spirits of just men made perfect. They are individuals who have the powers of the Holy Spirit, and who are justified through the Atonement of Christ and are living in harmony with Christ. When they go into the spirit world, they have endured faithfully to the end, and they therefore have their calling and election made sure. And one blessing and benefit of those who have their calling and election made sure is to commune with those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. And so as they go into the spirit world, then, as the prophet said, uh, they are not yet resurrected, but they inherit the same glory. Okay, They go to a state of celestial glory as disembodied spirits, or at least they have access on occasion to the visions of heaven opening the celestial glory to their view. Okay, Now, having said that, let's go back to Peter, James, and John. See, Peter and James and the others of the Twelve then wanted to come speedily unto Christ, he says, in my kingdom. Now, if they knew the doctrine, they wouldn't waste an important wish like that on uh, going to celestial glory as disembodied spirits, because that's where they were going to go anyway. Okay, A righteous person, when they die, will go to the celestial, to celestial glory. One such person was a patriarch in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith by the name of James Adams. And uh, as uh, the prophet talked about him, he indicated that he was uh, uh, one of the spirits of, just, of the just men made perfect. And then he makes uh, a comment here, if I can uh, find it in just a minute. He makes a comment and he says, Brother Adams has gone to the open a more effectual door for the dead. The spirits of the just are exalted to a greater and more glorious work. Hence they are blessed in the departure of the world of spirits. Enveloped in flaming fire, they are not far from us. See, they are in the midst of glory. They are not far from us, and no one understands our thoughts and feelings and are often pained therewith. He makes the statement, for example, that 
Uh, Patriarch Adams is not one of the spirits of the just men made perfect and revealed, now must be revealed in fire and the glory could not be endured. See? And so if Jesus came to you and you're a righteous person, and he says, now what would you like? And you said, I would like to come to you and, and the, when I die and, and, and enjoy celestial glory, what would you be doing? You'd be wasting a wish. Okay? Now the key to the understanding of that is this word, the word my, where the Savior says, uh, but uh, thou desirest that thou mightest speedily come unto me in my kingdom. Now my kingdom is the resurrection. My kingdom is not merely celestial glory in a disembodied state. Here, for example, in section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, <clears throat> as the Savior, sitting on Mount, the Mount of Olives, was talking to his disciples about his second coming and about their redemption in the resurrection, which will take place in the second coming. See, these people wouldn't die before Jesus, and hence then they wouldn't be resurrected with him in that resurrection. And except for special instances like Moroni, there was no resurrection of a mass nature until the second coming. As the prophet Joda pointed out, that Christ first, and then they that are with, that are Christ at his coming. And the point is at his coming. You see that? And so there isn't another resurrection until the second coming. And here these people then were sitting with the Savior on the Mount of Olives. And uh, he says this, I will show it plainly as I showed it to my disciples as I stood before them in the flesh and spake unto them, saying, you know what he says to these people now who have outlive him and hence not be with him in his resurrection, and who would wait clear down two thousand years or so. He says, As ye have asked of me concerning the signs of my coming, in the day when I shall come in my glory, in the clouds of heaven, to fulfill the promises that I have made unto your fathers, for as ye have looked upon the long absence of your spirits from your bodies to be a bondage. I will show you the day of how the day of redemption shall come, and also the resurrection, the restoration, rather, of scattered Israel. And then he talks about the Mount, the, the Mount of Olives scene, where he stands upon the Mount of Olives, where the trump sounds, and where the resurrection of the righteous takes place. And he says, Wherefore, if ye have slept, this is verse 46, Blessed are you, for as ye now behold me and know that I am, even so shall ye come unto me, and your soul shall live, and your redemption shall be perfected, and the saints shall come forth in the four, four quarters of the earth. Now, with the apostles knowing that, when Jesus said, Now I will give you the wish of your heart, and knowing also that righteous people go to a state of glory in the spirit world, then what are you going to desire of the Lord? I want to come to you speedily in your kingdom. In other words, I don't want to hang around those 2,000 years in the spirit world. And so he gave them that wish that uh, when they had completed their mortality and when they had passed on, then they would be exceptions to the rule. The rule is no resurrection until you get to the second coming, and they would be exceptions to that rule. Okay? Well, other kinds of revelations then in the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, not just through the Yerman Thummim, dictates by the spirit of revelation. You have a good example of that in section 85 of the Doctrine and Covenants where the prophet says, as he uh, writes this revelation, to give you some indication of how uh, potent the spirit of revelation was, verse 6, Yea, thus saith the still small voice, which whispereth through and pierceth all things, and oftentimes it maketh my bones to quake while it maketh manifest saying. See? And then he gives what the Spirit of Revelation said. Now there are revelations of that kind. And then there are inspired letters, section 121, 122, 123. Uh, these revelations are excerpts from extended letters which Joseph Smith wrote out of Missouri, out of the Liberty Jail in Missouri. And it's interesting to go back and read them in the original. He's writing along general instructions, and then you can just feel the power of revelation coming, and it's, Thus saith the Lord, bing, 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 see? And then it, it's raised to a higher level, and then he comes back and writes some more, and then 
whom the powers of the Spirit dictate. And he comes in, and those things that the Spirit of Revelation dictates of them, uh, we have put into uh, the Doctrine and Covenants. All right, now, in addition to that, then there are official documents. Uh, section 134 on, on political philosophy. We've got uh, Section 135 on the Prophet Joseph Smith's martyrdom. We've got uh, uh, the Manifesto. We've got the statement related to the priesthood. You see, these are official documents. Now, this is what the book, then, is, is made of. And let me just conclude here with the idea that, that, it's, that uh, it's not just that we now have these to study and that we have Joseph Smith as a person to, to become familiar with, but rather instead that this is to be an example to us. The great program of salvation is based on each person, each person, without exception, getting the spirit of revelation and growing and developing in that spirit. In one great discourse where the prophet begins with the doctrine of faith and ends with the calling election of faithful saints to celestial glory and the blessings of the second comforter, he then finally adds this little footnote. He says, the spirit of revelation is in connection with these blessings. A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation. For instance, you will feel pure intelligence flowing through you. It will give you sudden strokes of ideas. Remember one time when I was sitting back in a chair, you know, leaning so that you're just sitting on the two hind legs <clears throat> and studying comfortably, and your one leg is over the other, and you're just kind of balanced there? And one of these experiences, boom, and that was what I call a wow day, when the Spirit just opens things up. And it was one of those wow experiences, and it was so dramatic that I lost my balance. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was whirling legs and arms trying to keep my balance from falling over backwards. See? But uh, that's the kind of thing. This is, this is the Spirit of Revelation. Then he goes on and says, and thus by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation, now note, until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, how do you become perfect in Christ? By growing in the spirit of revelation, you see. In section 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, in Revelation to Oliver Cowdery, the Lord explains the spirit of revelation. <laughs> And he says, for example, Behold, verse 2, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you, and which shall dwell in your heart. Now behold, this is the spirit of revelation. Behold, this is the spirit by which Moses brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground. This is the Spirit. The prophet clarified on one occasion that when God reveals something to a person, he reveals it in the abstract or separate and apart from affinity with the mortal body. In other words, he reveals it just as though you had no mortal body. It's Spirit communicating directly to Spirit, to your Spirit, see? And then he goes on to say those revelations that he gives to you independent of your body just directly spirit to spirit, then can save you and be the means of sanctifying your flesh in the mortal state. See? But he gives to you. When Enos, for example, was up on the hill praying, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord came into my mind, saying, and then the voice of the Lord in whole words spoke to him. If you had been kneeling or sitting beside Enos on that occasion, you would never have heard the same, a thing unless the Spirit spoke to your spirit in the same way. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is a true principle. I know by personal experience this is a true principle. And it's the thing that constitutes a true Latter-day Saint. The person who doesn't live in the spirit of revelation somehow, some way, needs to get in harmony. If you have the spirit of revelation, and it'll be small, and it's a still small voice, imperceptible at times almost, 
you will have the flow of the Spirit. But it can, in such intensity, make itself manifest that it can be manifest in whole sentences and whole paragraphs of explanation. And that's a beautiful experience. That's an experience that just lasts you and lasts you. It's a beautiful experience. And each person can have this. And it's intended that each person should have this. And this, then, is why you need to center your life in Christ and have your eyes single to his glory, because the promise is that your whole body will be filled with light. And that light grows brighter and brighter until the perfect day. To which I bear you my testimony in the sacred name of Christ that Joseph Smith was indeed a prophet. I have had the rare privilege of studying that man since I was a boy. As a farmer boy in Idaho, southeast Idaho, I used to sneak books out of my dad's library and sit out in the ditch bank and let the water run wild. And, uh, and as I went into the military overseas, I took a half a barracks bag full of books. And then I've had the privilege academically of focusing in with the doors of research opened on original documents. And I've analyzed the information concerning the prophet from beginning to end. And I know that he I know that he's everything that he claims to be. He is in very deed a prophet and very seer, a revelator. I bear you that testimony. There's no issue on that. There just is no issue. If you were to take one single person where there's recorded evidence dealing with him, when they ask the question. Uh, what person do we know about in history where there is the most evidence to support that he is a prophet, seer, and revelator? That one person would be Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. He was a greater prophet than Isaiah. He was a greater seer than Samuel. He was a greater lawgiver than Moses. And he's done more for the salvation of men on this earth than any human being who has ever lived on it. And he will stand with Christ as the great priesthood figure of the Lord's kingdom next to him. And I bury that testimony in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Why do some sections seem disorganized and rambling? And that's a good one. Read section 20 of the Doctrine of Covenants. Had it in for an English theme. And uh, you get plumped. <clears throat> now, first of all, section 20 is actually a composite of several revelations given at the time, and so it's kind of put together. But that's uh, 1830. At that period of the prophet's life, and this is right after these translation of the Book of Mormon, he was literally an illiterate and unlearned man. Martin Harris said he couldn't spell the word February without using the Urban thumbs. And his wife said he couldn't dictate a coherent letter. And yet she says, there's a moral. He, he dictated the whole Book of Mormon. And when I'd call him for dinner, they'd break right off in the middle of a sentence. And then when they went back, he didn't go back and say, hey, Oliver, read me what we said before so I know what we're getting into. He just picked the thing up and started with the next word right on through. Now, I've had enough experience in writing. My book, God, Man, and the Universe, I wrote twelve times with a ballpoint pen and typed it, for I abandoned it to the publishers. And it comes hard. Writing is hard. And when I think that Joseph Smith completed that work, it's, it's just a marvel. The Book of Mormon is a miracle. It's a modern miracle. But some early revelations are like that, because they reflect the prophet's language. See, if you read Isaiah, it's one thing. Then you read Amos, the herdsman, in the Old Testament. And they're just two different kinds of language, you see. And yet the real spirit of Revelation is in them. But uh, later, beginning in the Missouri period, the prophet used to get up bright and early in the morning and study grammar. And he had a capacious mind. One person said Joseph was the calf that sucked three cows. Uh, he just, he, you couldn't get the guy full. He just had the ability to absorb, and like a sponge, and uh, he had probably the highest level of intellect of any man that we've had in the church. Just a tremendous native ability, and uh, he later then became a great grammarian. 
and some of the later revelations are polished classical documents. But some of these early ones reflect that. Because Martin Harris was at the meeting Christ attended, does he have his calling election made sure? And the answer is yes. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to see. Calling election made sure sometimes to people is, uh, means one thing, like being baptized. And that's not true. Uh, depends on to what you've been called and elected. And the promise that Martin got there and some of these other people got there was merely that they would be in the celestial kingdom, not that they would be exalted in it, not that they would have their wives and families in it. That, that's that's a, a, a sealing program of a later, of a later nature, see? And uh, while Martin was there and others were there, see, these sealing powers are exercised uh, among the early saints at an early time. You read section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 12, it won't take time to read it. Where he, the Lord, and this is 1831, he tells them that they have power to seal the people to eternal life. Well, the prophet sealed up the whole Colesville branch in the summer of 1831 down in, in Missouri. The whole of Zion's camp, a couple hundred men, were sealed to eternal life. My great-granddad was one of them. Uh, and that's all before the coming of Elijah. And we'll talk about that. In the meantime, don't destroy your testimony over the statement, because we need, we need to make it clear and don't have time to do so now. But the point is that uh, calling election made sure has different levels of expression and fulfillment. And it was this basic initial level they were talking about at the time. You mentioned 144,000. Is there any connected with them? Is there any connection with them and the prophets who will die in the streets of Jerusalem? I don't know. You can quote me. <laughs> uh, they'll be connected priesthood-wise, yes. 144,000 will minister both before the second coming. They'll minister in Jerusalem as well as in Zion, and they'll also minister after the second coming bring people into the church of the firstborn. So there may be, very may well possibly may be a connection. The probability is yes, but I really don't know. Is there, uh, if there is life uh, before the world was, why are many called and few chosen if the principles for ordination is in effect? If there was life before the world was, why are many called and few chosen if the principle of foreordination was in effect? Well, because you had your agency in pre earth life. And there were some people who just liked to sit and look at the human thumb and see the whole of celestial, the orb in which you live in a celestial state is, is a human thumb. And uh, that's better than television. <clears throat> you know, and you can get caught up and become a viewer rather than a worker. And you can get involved in a lot of other good and interesting things, but terrestrial in nature. You can do that. And that's what a lot of people sometimes do. And uh, those then, when you talk about few who were called and, and foreordained, we're talking about those who got on the, the stick and did a little for the work of the Lord. Why do you make a point to refer to section 134, 135, uh, the manifest official declarations? Are they not also revelations? And the answer is yes. Yeah, I, I, I don't, and I'm glad whoever wrote this for the comment. We're not saying that, that official declarations are not revelations. We're saying they're types of revelations. They're written by the Spirit of Revelation, but they're types of things, and would they fall in that classification? Although not from Joseph Smith, but still a Revelation example uh, through President Kimball, yes. See, I'm, I'm thankful for that clarification. See, it's not what I say, it's what I mean. You just kind of have to discern that. Why do some sections seem disorganized and rambling? Well, that's the end of it. Well, let's take a breather. Uh, we're running over time. We'll give you three minutes. How'll that be? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>